him. On the way, they started going uh, into the uh, territory of the people of Bani Mudlaj. There, and then somebody came to uh, to their uh, uh, tribe and and told them, "I've seen people by the coast of Tahama, and they may be Muhammad and his companion." And Suraka wanted to take all the prize to himself. It's a hundred camels and it's a big honor to be the capturer of this one, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he wanted to, to keep it all to himself. So he told his people, no, 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 that is not Muhammad. That is somebody so and so, I know what they were going for and, and I send them there and, and that's not Muhammad. Don't worry about it. So they believed him. And everybody sat and he sat with them. And then later on, he waited until everybody went, and then he got on his on his horse and he started chasing after Rasulullah. He took his weapon and he started chasing after Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Abu Bakr. And then he said, and this is Suraka that is narrating this after he became Muslim later on. And he said, after I stayed like for about an hour or more, everybody left and I started chasing after them. And I took my uh, my sword and I took my weapon and I started chasing them until I got close to them and I was getting closer and closing in on them. Then my 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 cat my horse trips and I fall off the back of my horse and I never fell off the back of my horse or any horse. He was such a good uh, horseman that he never fell off of any horse. He said, "This is the first time that happens to me." So I stood up, got my horse again got on it again and started chasing after them. Two, three steps and I fall back down to the ground again. What is this story he never felt before? And then he started and he said, well, I took Al-Azlam. Al-Azlam are those uh, uh, little birds that they say do and do not do. And I started uh, taking, making a lottery to see should I chase after them or not. And then the one I pulled said do not do. Do not chase after those. And I didn't like that. So I started chasing after them again. And I fell again. Then I took my Islam again and I pulled that one and it said, do not do. And I still got on my horse and I chased after them. And I fell again. Then I knew that this is not going to happen. And I started calling after Rasulullah and he was reciting the Quran and he did not even look one way or the other through the whole time. Only Abu Bakr was looking at me and he was kind of anxious. But Rasulullah, he was just reciting Quran peacefully on his way. He doesn't care about this man that's got the sword and the horse and, and coming to kill him. He was very safe and peaceful. Then I started calling and I called them with safety. I said, you are safe. I will not chase after you. And then they asked me to come. And then I got on my horse. I got to them and I was not tripping. I was, just, I was just fine. So then when, when he gave him the, the, the safety. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started talking to him and uh, he said, uh, anna. Do not tell anybody that we are going out of this way to, to Medina. Then I asked Rasulullah Suraqa said to give me a letter, to give me protection and safety from him from Rasulullah because I knew that Muhammad will become the leader of Arabia. There is no question that this man will not succeed on his endeavor. So he gave me a letter that Abu Bakr wrote that this is a man, this is a safe call from Muhammad to Suraqa bin Malik. And I kept it with me. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told me something that is very weird and very strange. This man that is fleeing on a horse of a camel in the middle of the desert and everybody is, is after his head for a hundred camel. He asked me, would you like to wear the braces of Kisra? Yes, Suraqa. Kisra, the emperor of Persia, to me, Suraqa. He said, the Muhammad was started to promise me that. And I said, yes. And Muhammad said, then you will wear them. And then Suraka got on his horse and go back, went back to his people and he told them, I looked and checked things out and there is nobody on this direction. The book that Rasulullah said, the letter that Rasulullah sallallahu gave to Suraka, Suraka kept it with him. 
until the day of Hunayn and at Ta'if. And Suraqa was taken as a prisoner, a non-Muslim prisoner with the Muslims, and he was taken into uh, slavery. And then he took the, the letter out and he said, I have a, a safe letter, safety letter from your prophet. And then they said, give it to us. And they looked at it. It looks like something. So they took it to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they said, is this true ya Rasulullah? And he said, yawma fa'in wa'ad. This is a day of, of fulfilling your promises. And he let them go free. So that letter as he let Abu Bakr and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam go free, that helped them to go free on that day. And then after the conquest of Persia, the treasures of Kisra came to Medina, and Umar ibn al-Khattab himself makes Suraqa, wears the bracelets of Kisra, and he asked him to raise his hands and show the entire people in Medina how he, with the promise of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was fulfilled, and the miracle of Allah was fulfilled, and here's that Bedouin, Suraq ibn Malik, is wearing the bracelets of Kisra ibn Hurmuz. Another event, quickly we go about that, is uh, they went into the tent of Umm Ma'bad, and she was from the people of Khuza'ah. Um, Abu Ma'bad, she was a very poor woman, she had nothing but a sheep uh, that, that, that is so old, it's so dry, it's not good for eating and it's not good for milking. So she had that sheep and she was by herself as her husband was outside the tent. And then they come to her and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked her, do you have anything to offer to us? They were on their journey, they were tired, they were thirsty, they wanted something. And she said, La wallahi la kana indana shay'un ma'a wa zakumul qura. If you, if I have something, you wouldn't have to ask for it. Then I would have already put it in front of you if I had anything. That's the, the custom of the Arabs when they receive the guest, is they offer immediately something, but she didn't. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa asked, asked her if he had, she had anything. She said, if I had anything, it would already be in front of you. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa looked at her uh, sheep and she said, and he said, what is the sheep, Umm Ma'bad? And she said, Shatun khallathaha al-juhdu anil ghanam. This is a sheep that is so tired and so weak that she cannot even walk with sheep anymore. And he said, hal biha min laban? Can I, does she have any milk? Maybe she can She said, he ajhadu min dalik. She is even weaker than to give us any milk. And he asked her permission to milk that shah. She said, fine. You give it your best shot, whatever you want to. I'm telling you, she doesn't have any milk. So Rasulullah takes that bowl, put it under the shah, and then he starts filling the, the bowl with milk. And the froth came to the top of that bowl and every, the whole bowl was full so he drinks Abu Bakr drinks Abu Ma'ba drinks fills the bowl again and fills all the bowls in her house and all that milk was coming from this old poor weak dry sh- uh, sheep and then he leaves and then Abu Ma'ba her husband comes over to the house and he asks her what happened what is, where is that milk from what happened to you uh, there is nothing that you can be milked in this house and she said, we were visited today by a blessed man. And that blessed man milked the, the shat for us, milked the sheep, and uh, all that milk came from this poor uh, old sheep. And the importance of the story of Umm Ma'bad in, in Islamic history is because she was a very eloquent uh, woman. And then in this hadith, she gives a detailed description of the features, the manners of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the description of Umm Ma'bad is actually the base of how we know Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's feature, how we know the way his physical appearance. So that was the importance of that stop. The 8th of Rabi al-Awwal, that's exactly one week after they left the uh, cave of Thawr, they reached the first place in Medina, and that is called Qiba. Qiba. And the place of Qiba is right outside Medina, and that was on the 23rd of September in 622. Narrated on Urwa ibn Zubayr that the people of Medina, when they knew that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had already left Mecca, Every day when they break, they go outside Medina 
and look over the hills of Qiba. If you know Qiba, it's a little bit higher outside Manila. And they would look towards Mecca and, and start scouting the horizon looking for Rasulullah. And they would wait all day. And then when night falls, they go back to Medina and they do the same thing the next day. And then he said, the, after they, uh, they, one day they, they waited and waited and waited. They started going back to their houses, and then one Jewish man, subhanAllah, was up on a palm tree looking towards Mecca, and he started hollering and screaming, Ya Ma'ashir al-Arab, O Arabs, Ya Bani Qila, the sons of Qila, and that was a derogatory uh, word that the Jews used to call uh, the people, uh, uh, the Arab people of Medina with. هذا جدكم الذي تنتظرون. This is your fortune that you are yet yeah, that you have been waiting for. And sometimes this is translated as grandfather, but that's a, that's a mistranslation. Uh, some people read it as جدكم. It is جدكم, which means that's your fortune. That's what you are waiting for. And then all Muslims started coming back and started looking and started making takbir, Allahu Akbar, when they said the two people coming in. And they did not know who Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was. The people of Medina, the ones that were not in, in the bay'ah of Aqaba, they did not know how Rasulullah looks like. And they started looking who is, who is the one. And then they saw one man is putting a cover over the other from the sun. And they knew that the one under the cover has to be Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the one that was covering him was Abu Bakr. And they received Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the place of Qiba. And then they, st- they uh, uh, came and uh, the verse that was uh, given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, saying, إِنَّ اللَّهَ, أط- إن الله هُوَ مَوْلَاهُ وَجِبْرِيلُ وَصَالُحُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ ظَهِيرٌ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now is supporting uh, His Prophet Himself and with Jibreel and with those righteous of the believers and then all the angels after that are the supporters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a new phase in Islam. This is when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got out from under oppression and persecution and the chase of those who rejected him and, and expelled him out of his city into a new horizon, into a new future and a new state, Islamic state in Medina, in Yathrib. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stayed in Qiba and he started building the first masjid of Qida, the first masjid in Islam that was established as a Muslim masjid. As the, we know the Masjid al-Haram uh, was a place of, of idol worshipping, the uh, Bayt al-Maqdis was also uh, not a masjid at that time, not a practiced masjid, but Masjid Qiba was the first established masjid in, Quran, in Islam. And when you go visit Medina, insha'Allah, you make wudu, you go to Qiba, you pray two rak'ah, and that is equal Umrah. And that is equal a full Umrah in that first masjid of Islam. And then at that time, as they were waiting, Ali ibn Abi Talib has reached them after he followed after them, migrated from uh, Mecca himself. And they stayed in Qiba Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And then people were ready to receive Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then they, he started heading down towards Medina. Uh, on uh, Friday, he reached uh, uh, the place where the people of Bani Salim ibn Awf live. Is that their territory between Qiba and Medina? And then he s- prayed the first Jum'ah. In, uh, he was Imam on the first Jum'ah in Medina and the first Jum'ah that he Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started leading the prayer and khutbah and we know before him Muslims in Medina used to do it and As'ad ibn Zurara was their khatib but then from that Friday on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started leading Jum'ah prayer then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered, Mac- entered Medina and from that day on Yathrib name was changed into Medina to Rasulullah which literally means the city of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it's known as Medina till today and then when he came to Medina, we have in, in this uh, uh, beautiful uh, song that he was received with, with the children and uh, the young uh, people of Medina started uh, reciting and singing to him. 
أشرق البدر علينا ون ذا طلع البدر علينا من ثنيات الوداع وجب الشكر علينا ما دعا لله داع أيها المبعوث فينا جئت بالأمر المطاع And this is a very famous uh, nasheed There's also some uh, controversy about this nasheed Thaniyat al-Wada is the, p- the place from the north that if you're coming from Asham to Medina you come to Medina from that place and that's the place that is mentioned in this poetry so some people say this is actually how he was received coming from the battle of Tabuk and not from Al-Hijra it doesn't really matter this is uh, how Rasulullah was received with joy and happiness in Medina and then he went into Medina and he uh, went to the territory of his uncles the people of Amina bint Wahab his mother uh, and they are the Bani Najjar and uh, he let his camel Al-Qaswa uh, lead him to wherever uh, she would uh, go as she was ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go and he, uh, she sat down near the house of Abu Ayyub Al-Ansari Abu Ayyub Al-Ansari received Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a guest and he uh, stayed with Abu Ayyub for about a month uh, Abu Ayyub received Rasulullah and he asked him to come into his house and he asked him to sit to uh, sit he had two story house asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to go upstairs he said Rasulullah I cannot live upstairs and be above you you have to be the one that are living upstairs and under the insistence of Abu Ayyub Rasulullah accepted that but then later on he asked Abu Ayyub to move downstairs because of all these visitors that would come in and out to visit Rasulullah and uh, some of the uh, historical accounts is not hadith that Abu Ayyub was it was hard for him to even walk so he wouldn't make noise that would bother Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam below him and one day they spilled water and they started uh, drying it with their own clothes so none of that would seep down to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he received Rasulullah in his heart before he received him in his house this was the important event of Al-Hijra this will conclude the entire Madani period uh, the entire Makki period the, the first 13 years of persecution the, the next 10 years Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will change the tone of da'wah will change the tone of call to Allah now establishing a state establishing a political, economical and social order La ilaha illallah has been established in the hearts of his companions now establishing a deen a deen is not only the customs of religion it's the way of life of Muslims and that's what we will go through the tone of Quran changes and that's why when you read the Quran you will see that uh, uh, this is a Makki surah and this is a Madani surah the first uh, part of Quran the Makki part is that one that establishes the, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, establishes faith, establishes endurance, establishes holding tight on your religion under any circumstances. The Madani part establishes jihad, establishing going out, spreading the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, establishing social order, family order, political order in Islam. We stop here inshallah and we have about seven minutes for discussion, comments, and questions, may Allah be, uh, may reward all of you, inshallah. Yes. Uh, he was freed uh, after Hunayn and Al-Ta'if, and we will go in, into that, inshallah, in more details. The question was, when did Suraqa bin Malik become a Muslim? Suraqa is the one that chased after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He did not accept Islam until he, after he was freed as a prisoner from uh, the, the battle of Hunayn and after he was freed he, was, he declared Islam and he uh, alhamdulillah died a Muslim and we know he witnessed the days of Umar ibn al-Khattab yes The, who made the arrangement for that person to, Abu Bakr Abu Bakr made all the arrangements remember Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came to him and, and asked him to, prepare, to uh, initially prepare the journey without, uh, without knowing when it's going to happen then on the day of the journey the day before the journey started 
he went to him and he told him. So he had the whole day to plan what's going to happen. Amr ibn Fahira was his servant. Was Abu Bakr's servant. So that was already in his house. And then they had the deal with the guide. I don't know. I don't know that. Aisha actually, uh, I probably missed to say that. Aisha... Uh, and Asma and Zaw and uh, Fatima and Umm Kulthum and Usama ibn Zayd and Umm Ayman. The question is, when did Aisha uh, follow Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Actually, his wife Sauda, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was married at that time. Sauda bin Zaman was his wife, and Fatima and, and Umm Kulthum, Usama ibn Zayd, uh, uh, his uh, the, his uh, uh, the son of his servant or his son in, in adoption at that time, Umm Ayman or Baraka al Habashiya, his, uh, his servant, they all were brought with uh, Aisha and the children of Abu Bakr led by uh, Abdullah ibn Abu Bakr. Jazakallah, I missed to say that. And that was after he reached uh, Medina. And they were brought to the house of Abu Ayyub. The only daughter that was left was Zainab. Zainab was married to Abu Al As. And she stayed in Mecca. But all the entire family followed them after he reached Medina. Why? The question is, the first bay'ah of Aqaba, the first pledge of Aqaba was called bay'ah al-Nisa, because there is no jihad. Why is the second one called the great bay'ah of Aqaba, bay'ah al-Aqaba al-Kubra? Because it was such an important event. Like you call Ghaswat Badr al-Kubra. If you looked at Badr, the battle of Badr, it has the least number of fighters of all the other battles. And it's called the great battle of of Badr. It's the importance of the historical importance and the importance of the event itself. Bay'at al-Aqab al-Kubra is what led to al-Hijra. And Hijra is what led to basically history of Islam. So that's why it's called Bay'at al-Aqab al-Kubra. It's not for anything but the importance historically and Islamically. Any comments about that? Of the second one, 73.